Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back once again to Vrax. In the last episode, we finally saw some real progress in the siege of the final citadel, when Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex ordered a full-scale, non-stop assault upon the lower gate spur. The objective would be taken regardless of casualties, and eventually, after a long night of continued enforced fighting on the Inquisitor's own orders, it was finally seized by the timely intervention of the Grey Knights, who had been ordered in no uncertain terms by the Lord Inquisitor that this would be a decisive battle, and that their participation was expected. And it was lucky indeed that they were there to take part, for without the intervention of the Grey Knights, this battle would almost certainly have ended like all the others. You know, bloody stalemate with nothing to show for it, but yet further mounting casualties. And the cost was high. Uh, the 30th Lion Corps had been thrown in its entirety, or at the very least, what remained of it, at the Lower Gate Spur, and due to the Inquisitor's efforts to infiltrate and destroy the laser defense battery that had killed one of the god machines of the Adeptus Titanicus, he insisted that they continue to fight throughout the night. But the Death Corps was engaged with traitor Space Marines who were infinitely superior to the poor guardsmen during the light of day, where they could actually see the traitors, but during the night, when the Death Corps was virtually blind, but the Chaos Space Marine still had the full advantage of their enhanced senses and, of course, superior Auspex equipment in their helmets, it turned from merely a slaughter into a completely one-sided hunt. And so, whilst the engagement finally ended in an Imperial victory, it was to many a hollow one. The 30th Lion Corps had been practically annihilated, a ground to dust whilst holding on to the lower gate spur during the long night until the Grey Knights finally arrived and carried it, throwing back the Chaos Space Marines and forcing them to retreat up the Pilgrim Road. Additionally, one of the god machines of the Adeptus Titanicus had been lost, and far worse was the way in which it had been lost, as it had been killed not by overt enemy action, being outmaneuvered, outfought, or simply surprised. It had been killed by poor intelligence. The southernmost laser defense battery was supposed to have been inert, destroyed by the lengthy bombardments leading up to the assault, and yet, it had not. And the Adeptus Mechanicus is not the forgiving sort. In fact, it is possible that it was this that was the primary reason for why the Lord Inquisitor insisted that the assault continue throughout the night, instead of allowing the 30th to retreat, reinforce, reorganize, and move forward on the second day because it was entirely possible that if no real progress had been made and a break in the fighting occurred, then Legio Astorum may very well deem that this was the end of the offensive. They might then withdraw their support to it and hold the Inquisitor responsible for the destruction of one of its precious titans, for little to no gains and due to his own impetuous nature and with the strained relationship already present between the Lord Inquisitor and the High Principe, that may very well have resulted in the complete withdrawal of the Legion itself. If nothing else, at the very least this worst-case scenario had been avoided. But all in all, frighteningly little had been gained in trade for a god machine, and the essential annihilation of the 30th Line Corps. The capture of the Lower Gate Spur in and of itself was fairly inconsequential. It did mean that the Southern Laser Defense Bastion could now be permanently taken out of action, and it could then be used as an observation platform to guide further artillery fire down upon the Citadel more accurately, but it was not a breach in the Citadel's own walls, and it would not prove an overly advantageous position from which to launch further assaults. 
as any further offensives would have to make its way slowly up the Pilgrim Road, exposed to a huge quantity of defensive guns. However, the offensive had achieved what was in all due reality its primary objective, and that, of course, was simply to buy yet more time for the Lord Inquisitor and keep his political enemies at bay. Thousands upon thousands of men had been sacrificed all in the name of keeping Lord Hector X in charge. Something that quite a few under his command might start questioning whether or not had truly been worth it. Many a Death Court officer had questioned the odd approach that Marshal Kagori had had to waging the war on Vrax, but Kagori had produced results and he had done so far more cheaply than the Lord Inquisitor. And whilst the cost may not have mattered a few years ago, when the 88th was still highly prioritised by the Adeptus Munitorum, that was no longer the fact, and some may begin to question whether or not the 88th could survive this rate of attrition. But luckily for Lord Hector, he was about to receive reinforcements. He had sent out various envoys in an attempt to enlist the aid of the mighty Adeptus Astartes, the God Emperor's Avenging Angels, the Space Marines. And finally, one of those requests had borne fruit. It had taken a long time, as the envoy had to travel a considerable distance indeed, but finally, he was able to place the Lord Inquisitor's written request directly into the hands of Chapter Lord High Commander Verent Ortris of the Red Scorpions. As you may recall, the Red Scorpions had already intervened in the war on Vrax. Then, on the behalf of the Lord Inquisitor's predecessor, Marshal Arnim Kagori, the Red Scorpions had carried out a bold deep strike assault, seizing control of the breach first via a squad of assault marines dropped from the back of a Thunderhawk transport which passed over it in the dead of the night. They then placed a teleporter beacon which carried in reinforcements from the Red Scorpions first company Terminator Elites. This small but highly effective force then managed to hold onto the breach for long enough for the Red Scorpions mechanized reserves to rush up and deploy tactical and devastator squads. The Astartes were then later relieved by the 88's own forces led in by an assault corps. The taking of the breach had been a pivotal moment in the war on Vrax, as it forced the enemy to surrender their outward positions that they had seized during a counter-attack. Now they were finally almost completely hemmed up within the curtain walls, and upon further breaches then being led by the Lord Inquisitor, it sent the last few remnants of the Cardinal's forces fleeing back into the Citadel itself. And without the intervention of the Red Scorpions, it is entirely possible that the 88th would still have been held out by those very same curtain walls attempting to make another breach or battering its way through the one already created. It would however still take quite some time before the Red Scorpions were willing to commit themselves to the war on Vrax again. The Lord's request would be brought before not only the Lord High Commander, but also the leading officers of the Red Scorpions. Together, they would decide whether or not to once again go to that hellish planet, and they would have to take into consideration that whilst the Strike Force had indeed managed to secure the breach, the Force had suffered devastating casualties, and if they had caught news of the Red Hunter's fate, upon the lower armory gates, that might be yet further reason for the Red Scorpions to decide that maybe, just maybe, we will let this request pass us by. The Red Scorpions were certainly not cowards, they had already fought on Vrax, but they only had a thousand battle brothers, the size of any other chapter, and they had to decide where their limited numbers and resources could be best spent, and any commitment to Vrax 
would have to be a considerable one, and would almost certainly be met with equally considerable casualties. Was this truly the best use of their battle brothers? Well, the captains themselves were wavering, but the Lord Commander's envoy earned his keep as he made an impassionate plea to the commanders, stating that treason against the Imperium was the most vile and base form of criminality, and that the traitors on Vrax were the worst of the worst. And should they be allowed to go unpunished, they would spread like cancer across the Imperium. And as it stood right now, uh, the Lord Inquisitor feared that he could not bring enough forces to bear to guarantee the defeat of the insidious enemy. And that is why he had sent envoys, just like the man speaking to the captains now, to request the aid of the Adeptus Astartes, reminding them in a subtle fashion that the Lord Inquisitor could simply have demanded their obedience, but he chose instead to ask for their help. And thusly, with the envoys' passionate speech still foremost in their minds, the captains withdrew to discuss the matter amongst themselves. And after a lengthy period of, no doubt, intense discussion, they emerged once again to inform the Inquisitor's envoy that the Red Scorpion's chapter were willing to acquiesce to the Lord Inquisitor's most polite request. And they would, with all due haste, dispatch a force consisting of the Battle Barge Sword of Ordon, along with four company-sized formations, to Vrax. Although they also informed the envoy that it would take some time before the necessary preparations were made. They had been informed that Vrax had become the haunt of demons, and so extra precautions would have to be made. Each battle brother would have to steal his soul through a lengthy period of fasting and religious preparations. In addition, the weapons, the armor, and the machines of the chapter would all have to be blessed and prepared for the trials to come. And finally, with all this done, the Sword of Ordon and its two cruisers arrived in the Vrax system at 159830 Millennia 41. The Strike Force then began disembarking its battle brothers and equipment down onto the surface, where High Commander Ortis personally, leading the Strike Force, went to meet Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex. This was something that the Lord Inquisitor must have been particularly pleased about. The arrival of 400 Astartes was obviously quite the relief in and of itself, but the fact that the force was commanded by the Chapter Master personally not only showed that the Red Scorpions were serious in their commitment to ending the war on Vrax, but his presence also lent a great deal of legitimacy to the Lord Inquisitor himself. Since the presence of an Astartes chapter master would be viewed by many of his political enemies as an implicit endorsement on behalf of the Red Scorpions for the Lord Inquisitor's actions. And even better for Hector X, the Scorpions also brought with them a certain sense of pride and determination. They were the ones who had taken the curtain walls, and so now that they had arrived with a larger force, they felt it was their honor-bound duty to finally end the conflict. And thusly, they requested the most difficult mission the Lord Inquisitor could impart upon them, the most arduous task, and the most well-defended objective. And Lord Hector X was happy to comply. The objective was to be the very same that the attack upon the Lower Gates Bird had opened access to. The Red Scorpions would move up the Pilgrim Road and towards the St. Leonis Gate. Then they would seize the massive armoured gatehouse itself and hold it against any potential enemy counterattacks, opening up a path straight towards the Basilica of St. Leonis itself. This meant that the Red Scorpions would have to advance up 
the single pilgrim road in full view of all of the enemy's defenses. Then, fight their way into a long tunnel complex leading to the St. Leonis Gate. A tunnel complex no doubt filled to the brim with the defensive weaponry, mines and all manners of unfortunate obstacles. And finally, once they have fought their way through the gate, they would then have to take the armoured gatehouse itself, which, due to the protection of the void shield generators, was almost entirely intact. The massive artillery barrages had at best scratched some of the paintwork, scuffed the battlements a little bit, whilst the main structure itself was virtually untouched and was expected to house a vast quantity of traitor soldiers. And of course, then there was the problem of the traitor space marines. The Black Brethren had already shown an interest in protecting this side of the Citadel. They had countercharged a 30th Line Corps attack upon the lower gatehouse spur, and when the Red Scorpions would be driving for it, there was every chance that the Black Brethren would make another appearance, pitting the best of the worst against the God Emperor's finest warriors. And, of course, there was also the demons to take into consideration. The Grey Knights would, as always, be in reserve, but as we have already seen, the Grey Knights' definition of what is and is not a worthy target Hmm, well, let's just say that it doesn't necessarily have a whole lot to do with the concept of preserving the life of their allies. Commander Ortiz had asked for a tough assignment, and he had most certainly gotten one. Now he would withdraw along with his officers and plan on how to achieve his objectives, preferably without getting all of his brothers murdered in the process. Luckily for the Red Scorpions, they had access to far more reconnaissance data than the previous attack both upon the Armory Gate and the Lower Gate Spur had. With the capture of the Lower Gate Spur, the Death Corps was able to observe the remaining positions leading up to the St. Leonis Gate in great detail, and by doing so, they had identified a series of strong points carved out of the mountains leading up to the Citadel itself. These had been well hidden, and if the Lower Gate Spur had not been seized, it is entirely possible that they would have escaped notice, which could potentially have led to yet another situation like we saw with the first attack upon the Citadel, with the movement towards the Lower Gate Spur being stopped and cut to pieces by a well-prepared enemy ambush. First and foremost, then, these positions would have to be dealt with but they would have to be dealt with without weakening the main assault over much, and since the terrain was difficult, to put it mildly, that task would be given to the assault marines. Terrain that might take a Death Corps Guardsman hours to pass, an assault marine could simply just leap over in minutes at most, giving them an extraordinarily advantage in mobility over the defenders but it was also important that these positions be suppressed and destroyed quickly, and so a fairly considerable force would be sent. Assault squads from the 3rd and 8th Company, along with a formation of 1st Company Vanguard elites, would be sent towards them. This force was expected to be able to at the very least suppress and probably outright destroy the positions in a brief period of time allowing for the second phase of the Red Scorpion's plan to leap into action. This would see the Red Scorpion's armoured and mechanised elements simply rush up the Pilgrim Road, as swiftly as their rhinos, land raiders and razorbacks could possibly carry them. It was not a subtle approach, it was not a particularly well planned out approach, and there wasn't a whole lot of finesse to it either, but frankly, there was no good way to approach the drive up the Pilgrim Road. Or at the very least, if there was, Lord Commander Ortis was incapable of spotting it. And so, bereft of a good approach, he would have to make do with a swift one. 
Trusting in the protection of their armoured personnel carriers and in the skill of their drivers to bring them around any potential obstacles and out of the worst areas of fire quickly and, hopefully, relatively unscathed. But of course, simply trusting in the God Emperor's good graces will only ever get you so far. And the Red Scorpions were more than aware of this, and had prepared means with which to try and suppress the enemy's defences as much as possible. This would be more or less like pissing into a hurricane in all due reality, but even reducing the weight of fire bearing down upon the mechanized spearhead by even the smallest of portions could make all the difference. And assigned to the duty of creating that difference was the land speeder elements of the Red Scorpions along with the Thunderhawk gunships. The Thunderhawks would strafe the walls themselves, targeting any spotted gun positions and blasting the upper parapets, whilst the Land Raiders would sweep up and down the Pilgrim Road, navigating the difficult terrain on both sides of it with their anti-gravity engines, allowing them to engage the enemy's wall-mounted defences with considerable accuracy while still staying fast enough and unimpeded by the terrain to hopefully provide a very difficult target for the wall gunners to hit. This would, however, nevertheless be by far the most dangerous duty of any Red Scorpion in this attack. The land speeders would present clear and present dangers to the gunners, and far more pressingly so than the armoured spearhead slowly making its way up the Pilgrim Road, already covered by obstacles. And so the poor land speeders not exactly over-blessed with armour in the first place, would be drawing a frightening quantity of firepower. Beneath the protecting fire of the Lamp Speeders and the Thunderhawks, the mechanized spearhead should at this point be reaching the lower gate entrance and begin fighting their way up the tunnels leading to the St. Leonis Gate. And this was the part of the plan that Commander Ortis considered to be the most risky part, his battle brothers would have to secure passage up the tunnels and into the gatehouse quickly to keep the advantage. If they were bottled up there, they would continuously be pounded by the gate defences and the wall-mounted weaponry, and due to the very narrow approach, there was a real chance that even mere mortal troops could simply choke the passageway and deny the Red Scorpion's entry and further progress. The usual answer to this problem would be to lay down an artillery barrage behind the armoured gatehouse, thereby preventing enemy reinforcements from simply just streaming into the tunnels below. Unfortunately, due to the void shields, this was not an option, and being able to bring down the void shields on command was rather difficult. It was, as mentioned previously, an imprecise science when and how a void shield generator was eventually overloaded, and so there was no guarantee that the heavy guns of the 88th would be able to assist the Red Scorpions when they needed it the most. To solve this quandary, Lord Commander Ortis decided to adopt a somewhat unorthodox and frankly batshit insane approach. He reasoned that if the Death Corps artillery could not guarantee their ability to bring down the Void Shields when he needed them to, and that the reason for that was that they did not have enough firepower, then all he would have to do was bring enough firepower. And as it so happened, he had quite a lot of firepower at his command, sitting in orbit in the form of the Battle Barge he had brought with him. And so, Ortis simply ordered the Battle Barge Sword of Ordon to close into low orbit during the Red Scorpion's assault and begin to bombard the gatehouse. This was patently insane for more than one reason. First and foremost, whilst two of the laser defence batteries on the Citadel were confirmed to be destroyed, that still left potentially three. The 88 was relatively sure that they'd been able to knock out at least one and probably two of the others, but, well, they were also quite sure that they had knocked out the southern one as well. 
And if, by some chance, all three of the batteries were proven to still be operational, hmm, a battle barge is a mighty tough cookie, but that could be a problem. If there was only one battery left, or maybe two, the battle barge would be at a relatively little risk of being destroyed. Battered, certainly, but destroyed, very unlikely. If all three were still operational, things were going to start getting just a little bit hairy. But even more so than the mere prospect of the destruction of the battle barge, was the fact that it had been ordered to launch an orbital bombardment within a few hundred meters of the Red Scorpions themselves. Shells the size of city blocks would be landing, quite literally, right at their doorstep. One poorly aimed round, one shell that malfunctioned and had its stabilizers send it just a degree or so off target, and the entire Red Scorpion strike force could be in for a very unfortunate surprise. Lord Commander Ortiz must have had absolutely supreme confidence in the gunnery skills of the crew aboard the Sword of Ordon to even consider this approach. And also bear in mind, it wasn't just his own men he was rescuing here. The Death Corps of Krieg and the Inquisitors would also be launching their own diversionary attacks to ensure that the enemy could not launch all of their reserves against the Red Scorpions alone. And once again, if one of those shells malfunctioned, was sent a bit off course, <laughs> we're talking about shells launched from orbit here. A degree of error could send it flying kilometers in the wrong direction. And with that in mind, actually allow me to modify my previous statement. An error could not only give the Red Scorpions a rude awakening, it could deliver one rather abruptly and unexpectedly to any area of the 88's front lines. But hey, nothing ventured, nothing gained I suppose. And the Red Scorpions most definitively were playing for keeps here. In addition to the main assault that would make its way up the Pilgrim's Road, there were two other forces present. One would make a diversionary attack upon the Great Gate. This would consist mostly of scouts and some armoured and Astartes Battle Brother elements to present a credible enough threat to the enemy and a significant reserve force would be kept aboard the Sword of Ordon, ready in their drop pods and the Teleportarum to launch themselves down directly into the Citadel if it would appear that any of the forces attacking it were at the brink of a breakthrough. No one wanted to risk another Red Hunter's Deep Strike incident, but having a significant reserve force could of course be used both as the final ingredient to tip a stalemate over into a victory, but could also potentially be used defensively to cover the retreat of any of the other forces. And speaking of other troops, the Red Scorpions would of course not be going it entirely alone. To the north, a Krieg diversionary attack would be launched on a wide front. They would skirmish with the defenders and utilize their positions gained during the attack upon the ravine to launch small, annoying raids on the northern areas of the citadel. Additionally, a small attack would be made on the northernmost laser defense bastion. And another force would be made up of Inquisitors, including Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex and his Grey Knights specifically from Strike Force Arturus, with the second Strike Force remaining in orbit ready to be deployed if shit was about to turn demonic. And with all of the planning made, all that was left to do now was to prepare once again for yet another assault upon the Citadel. This time it had a good chance of success. Now that the Great Knights had fully committed themselves to the fight, they could add their expertise and fighting prowess to the offensive. And further supported by the Red Scorpions and of course the Red Hunters embedded alongside the Inquisitors with the diversionary assaults from yet another Line Corps, 
it appeared as if this plan had a real potential, and undoubtedly the Lord Inquisitor was thinking that this might finally be it. Enough overwhelming force and firepower has finally been gathered to crack this last horribly mutated chaos nut of Vrax. But, of course, as so many times before, the enemy might have something to say about the Imperium's plans, and whether or not they wanted to go along with them. Although, at the very least, in this case, the Lord Inquisitor was betting far less heavily on the assumption that the enemy would simply just let him do whatever it was he wanted to do. So, progress, I suppose. And with that, I'll wrap this one up. You can expect a couple of hour-long ones now, since we will be entering into some really heavy fighting. This one was a little bit short, just 30 hours of preparation. I'd hope to get the first big one out of the way today, but I've been somewhat busy this week, so I hope you can forgive me for just a single 30-minute long video this week. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.